Well, this morning uh, we're coming to the next chapter of uh, the Gospel of John. Last week we covered a a huge amount of ground because of the common theme that was woven through those uh, many verses, I think, something like 50 verses. We, we saw Christ, the bread of life. We also saw what it is the Father does in order to bring uh, Christ's sheep home to Him. Well, now we're going to move on to uh, chapter 7, and we're going to look at these um, preliminary remarks, uh, this, this conflict that took place between Jesus and his brothers before we move into the next great discourse of our Lord Jesus Christ, which has to do, of course, with that water that is poured out during the Feast of the Tabernacles. But let me read for you then those uh, prefatory remarks in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, and this is going to be our text for this morning. This is what John writes. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booze, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you were doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. Now, I realize uh, we probably have a number of ideas of what Jesus is actually saying here, but hopefully we'll be able to get a clearer picture of, of what's going on. Now, again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I, I've already started to tell you, last week we saw Jesus speaking of himself as the bread of life as the one that we must believe in if we are to be saved, the one that we are to receive, uh, referring to it in a certain sense as an eating of him in a spiritual way. And again, I would just remind you that he's not talking about physical eating of Christ, not his body and blood in, around, and under, or even the elements transformed, as it were, of the Lord's Supper into his body and blood. But what he was saying is that by becoming a man for us through his flesh and blood, he has merited for us life, and he is our source of life. And we must, in a spiritual sense, feed upon Jesus Christ if we are to have this life. Not only that, he told us that we must continue to feed upon him, and that is through the different means he has given to us, through the word, through prayer, through the Lord's table, by meditating on our baptism By fellowshipping together, we must use these means. We must feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ in a spiritual way if we are to have the spiritual strength we need to serve him. As long as we stay away from these things, we are going to be, well, as Spurgeon says, fasting. Fasting, spiritually fasting, in the sense that we are depriving our souls of food and we will become weak and unable to serve the Lord as we should. So that's what we learned from the Bread of Life Discourse. But Jesus also told us how we can come to Jesus and feed upon Him and the only way that we can, and that is through the sovereign work of His Father, through His drawing us to Christ, by His Holy Spirit, who alone can change our hearts and give us the desire to come to Jesus. You know, Jesus really, as it were, pulled back the curtain, showed us what was going on behind the scenes in the lives of anyone who comes to Jesus Christ. We can only come by the grace of God. We can only come by His drawing us. And we saw that that was more than just wooing us or giving us, as it were, incentives to come. It literally means compelling. And it compels us from within by the Spirit of God. Now, this reminded us of two things that if you are trusting Jesus Christ this morning, it is purely because of God's mercy. It is not because you were smarter. It's not because you saw your need. It had nothing to do with you. 
But it had everything to do with God. It had everything to do with his mercy, which is why you must give him all the glory and all the credit. Now, it also encouraged us that as we evangelize, we know there will be those who will respond to the gospel because the Father will draw those he has given to his Son, to his Son, through your witness. It gives us the guarantee, the confidence that people will come. And Jesus said, all the Father gives him will come to him, and the one who comes to him he will certainly not cast out. They know that they can, we will be received by Christ. Now this morning we see Jesus again in Galilee, likely still in Capernaum, because Capernaum was his headquarters, because Capernaum is where he lived. As a matter of fact, we saw earlier that Jesus took his mother and his brothers, his family, to Capernaum. He's the eldest brother. It appears as though Joseph is gone now, and Jesus in some ways is providing for his household. But we see him now in Capernaum having a conversation with his brothers about going up to the Feast of Booths. Now we learn from this conversation that even though his brothers had had the chance to see Jesus for many years, having grown up in the same household that he grew up in, they still did not believe. And because they didn't believe, they were at odds with him. Now, this reminds us, and again, this is the main point. We're going to see several things this morning. But I want to remind us of the main point, and that is the gospel does not always unite households. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, most often, it divides them. And that's what we saw Jesus telling us earlier in Matthew chapter 10. Now, this morning, I want us to consider three things. First of all, that principle, the gospel divides Households Very often, not all the time, thankfully, you know, God does show mercy sometimes to entire households and we need to thank him for that. But very often, perhaps most often it does, that this division will express itself in conflict. You know, where you have the two kingdoms, there's going to be battles going on between the two kingdoms. Tell me if you don't think that's true. <laughs> and then finally, how we should respond to this conflict, to those particularly in our own households that don't believe. So first of all, let's consider the gospel very often divides households. Now we see that Jesus wanted to avoid Judea. And he wanted to avoid it because of the division the gospel makes in the world. Now it's interesting, I say the world. I mean, let's remember where Jesus was. Let's remember who, who it was that was going to be at that feast, who it was that wanted to kill him. It was God's people. <laughs> this was not the world as we typically think about it. This was the kingdom of God uh, in those days because of the division that the gospel makes in the world. The Jews hated him and they wanted to do away with him. They wanted to kill him. We read in verse 1, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, we're never surprised by that because we've seen that time and time again in the Gospels. The Jews hated Jesus. But let's not forget who the Jews were. Again, God's old covenant people, the church of that time, they were the ones who hated him and wanted to kill him. And why? Because the world was in the church. I think you would all agree with me that that was the case. Now, how did Jesus know that the Jews still wanted to kill him. Well, because between the time we read about Jesus last celebrating the Passover in John chapter 5 and, and the time now Jesus celebrated another Passover. In John chapter 6, verse 4, we're not going to necessarily look at that. John had told us that the Passover was near. And now we're at the Feast of Booths, which means that a good amount of time has passed. There's been another Passover that has been celebrated. We do know that Jesus was faithful to his father's commandments and he would have gone to that Passover in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and there he would have found the Jews still hated him and wanted to kill him. Now, why did they hate him? Why did they want to kill him? Because we saw in John chapter 5, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. He made him whole. A work of mercy? A work of necessity, I suppose he could have healed him on another day. Certainly it was a work of mercy, and for that they wanted to kill him, plus the fact 
that he had called God his father, making himself equal with God. Judea was a dangerous place for Jesus to be, and yet he was willing, at least he, we're going to see he's going to go up there anyway at a certain point because that was what his father wanted him to do. But at least at that particular time, he was unwilling to walk in Judea. He was unwilling to go there. Now this reminds us that the world is a dangerous place for the Christian. The world is a dangerous place for you if you're professing the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, we still need to go out into it. We still live here, don't we? And we still have a work to do. And that work is to bring the gospel to them because that's what our Lord calls us to do. Because that is the only way any of them are going to be saved. Now, when you consider what Jesus was willing to do, I mean, look at what Jesus did. He came into a world that was hostile against him. He ministered the gospel openly. He brought down the anger, as it were, of the Jews against him continually. And they finally reached the point where they killed him. That's what Jesus was willing to do to serve his father and, and to bring, as it were, the kingdom of heaven into this world. What are we going to be willing to do? If it was worth it to him to, to pay the price that he paid, it should also be worth it to us to do the same for the glory of the Father and for the glory of the Son, particularly when you consider what the Son has actually done for you through his life and through his death. Now Jesus goes on to tell us in verse 2 that the feast of the Jews, the feast of booze, was near, which means he was going to have to go into Judea. This was one of the three main feasts that all the Jewish men within Israel were required to attend no matter where they lived in the entire Roman Empire. This was the feast, by the way, that reminded the Jews that they were once wanderers. They once uh, didn't have a permanent home. They lived in tents, which is why they lived in booths during the time of this feast. They were once wanderers without a home, but the Lord brought them into their own land. Now, since it was a required feast, there was no question that Jesus would attend it. The only question really was when he was going to attend it. Apparently, you didn't have to be there at the beginning, but you did have to show up at some point. Now, that's important to understand if we're going to understand what Jesus is actually talking about in our passage when he says, my time is not yet, because he's not referring to his death. Now, Jesus said he, it's not his time. He's not going to go up to this feast because, again, the Jews were seeking to kill him. But yet, in the meantime, we see that Jesus was willing to walk in Galilee, which means not just that he was walking around the shore, as it were, just kind of taking it easy, but that he was continuing to preach. He was continuing to heal. He was continuing to minister and to do as much good as he could possibly do in Galilee. Now, Jesus understood what we sometimes don't understand quite so well, and that is that our time in this world is really quite limited. And so we need to try to make the best use of our time that we possibly can while we're in the world. If, if there's one door that's closed to us, look for another door. Look for an open door that you can go through and minister. Make the best use of your time. Now, the gospel is not only going to make a division between us and the world, it's also going to divide our households, as I've already said. Whenever you have the two kingdoms in one place, wherever they both exist at the same time, wherever you have believers and unbelievers, there's going to be division. And such was the case in Jesus' household. Now, Jesus, obviously, being the Christ, you know, we, he is a believer, and there were others, perhaps, well, Mary, to be sure, was a believer. But aside from those two, and perhaps the fact that they were staying maybe with Peter, uh, you have believers present, but you also have unbelievers, the brothers of Jesus. We read in verse 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. Now, who are these brothers? Well, they're Jesus' brothers, right? They are his stepbrothers. They are the natural children of Joseph and Mary. After Mary conceived and gave birth to Jesus as a virgin, she and Joseph had at least six more children, four brothers and at least two more sisters, perhaps more than that. Uh, we read about them in Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 and 56, 
where those of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, said about Jesus, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Not Judas Iscariot, but another Judas. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Notice sisters, which means more than one. Where then did this man get all these things? Now, this is a list of his brothers and the fact that he had at least two sisters. And they, Jesus is telling us, or at least John is telling us, they were not believing in him at this time. Now, we know that at least two of these brothers will later come to believe in Jesus. James, the James that's mentioned here, is the one who is going to lead the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. He's the one who's going to write the letter of James. And the Judas that is mentioned here is not, of course, as I mentioned before, not the one who betrays him. Although, how would you like to be called Judas after that happened? Maybe that's the reason why his name is different in the letter that he wrote. Because this is the Jude that writes the book of Jude. But at least, as I've said before, at this time they did not believe. These two kingdoms were present in his house. And so there was a division. Again, I would remind you of what Jesus said to his disciples just before he sent them out to teach and to preach in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Sometimes we tend to think that we just transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and everybody just sort of, you know, all these households just sort of stayed together and just continued. But that's not what Jesus said was going to happen. That's not what we actually see happening here. And that's because grace, as Matthew Henry puts it, doesn't necessarily run in families. It doesn't run in blood. If there was any one household on earth where if that principle were true, we should see it happening, it would be in the household of Joseph and Mary. Joseph was a righteous man. Mary was a righteous woman. She was chosen to be the one that would bear the Messiah. If, if we were expecting to see all the children saved, that's where we would expect to see it, especially since Jesus was in that family. But I tell you what, we'd be hard-pressed to find any one family in Scripture where all the children actually believed that wasn't divided in this way, that didn't have representatives from both kingdoms. Now, maybe this has been your experience. If, if, if it is, you're not alone because the gospel brings division. Now, let me just mention this. The fact that you may have division right now doesn't mean that you will always have division. The Lord may yet call your children and bring them into his kingdom. And that's something, of course, we always pray and hope for. Until they die, you, you don't know. You just don't know. The Lord may call them even at the last minute. Now, obviously, as I've said before, if you have that division in your household, that division is going to express itself in conflict. I mean, we see that that's what happened between Jesus and his brothers. We read in verses 3 and 4. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you were doing, for no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In light of this coming feast, they say, Jesus, go up to Judea. And here's two good reasons why you should, which on the surface would almost lead you to think that they actually believed and you know except for the fact that verse 5 tells us they didn't first of all he should go up they said and show himself to his disciples to encourage them now they weren't talking about the 12 because the 12 were still with them but they were talking about those Jews who believed that he was the Messiah that he was going to set up a temporal kingdom and that it was going to have its headquarters in Jerusalem secondly they said you should go up not only to encourage your disciples but to further your plan, Jesus, to make yourself known. Remember verse 4 says, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now we do need to understand that if it looks like there was anything positive in what they were saying, it was only a, pre, a pretense. They really just wanted to trap him. They knew that the people in Judea hated him as well and wanted to kill him. 
At the very least, they were mocking Jesus. We've already seen again they did not believe. But I want you to consider a few other things about their counsel to him that is inappropriate. I mean, if you know and you believe who Jesus is, that he's the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, are you going to tell him what to do? No, you're not going to tell him what to do. You're going to listen to him and let him tell you what to do. You're going to submit to him. They weren't submitting to him. They were telling Jesus what they thought he should be doing. You know, we need to be careful that we don't do the same thing. Tell Jesus what he should say and what he shouldn't say. Our responsibility is simply to listen to what he tells us in his word. Secondly, if you love Jesus, would you throw him into the middle of a situation where you know he was in danger? You would try to protect him. They were encouraging him to go where the Jews wanted to kill him. Now let me just remind you of something we're going to see in John's Gospel in, in chapter 11 where Martha and Mary will send messengers to Jesus regarding Lazarus because he's sick. Jesus is going to decide to go back into Judea to help him and his disciples are going to say to him in John 11 verse 8, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and are you going there again? You see, if you cared about Jesus, you wouldn't put him into a situation where, or encourage him to go into a situation where he's going to be hurt. You would try to protect him. Even Peter, when he told Jesus, you know, this will never happen to you, Lord. You're not going to go to Jerusalem. In that case, he was standing in the way of what the Lord intended. And so again, was trying to tell Jesus what to do. We don't tell Jesus what to do. He always does the right thing. He always says the right thing. We need to listen to him. If you believe that Jesus is the sinless Son of God, are you going to suggest to Jesus that he might be sinning by implying that he's purposely withholding his encouragement from his disciples when they need for him to be there to strengthen their faith? Are you going to imply that Jesus is a coward because he was afraid to go up to Judea and face the opposition? Or that he was doing these things that he was doing simply because he wanted to make a name for himself? You wouldn't make those implications because you know that Jesus is perfect. They did not believe in Jesus. They did not love Jesus. Jesus says they were of the world. Actually, he's going to tell us that that's what they are, which is why they hated him and why they were having this conflict. Uh, have you ever noticed, if you had the experience of being in a household where you have believers and unbelievers, have you ever found yourself on the other side of an issue? with those in your house that don't believe? It happens because of this division, because of the fact that there are two kingdoms in your household that are at war with each other. So here's the conflict. How does Jesus resolve it? Well, he tells them to go up to the feast, but he stays behind. We read in verses 6 through 9. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it, that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. He says to them, my time has not yet come, but your time basically is always at hand. Now, I, I made mention of this once before. What he meant by this is that the time of his going up to the feast had not yet come, not the time for him to die. We might be tempted to think he was speaking about his death and that if he went up to the feast, he would be killed, and that's why he didn't want to go. But we need to see it, well, we need to see that if we look at it in this way, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense out of the fact that he parallels his time with their time. My time has not yet come, but yours is always at hand. How, if, if he's talking about the time of his death, how, what is he talking about with regard to them? He's talking about his timing, about going up to the feast. He actually does go to this feast. And if he goes to the feast, but then he's already told us he's not going to go to the feast, Jesus just contradicted himself. And we know that that can't happen. But we also know that this is a feast that was required by the Father that he go to. So Jesus must go to this feast in obedience to his Father. So he's not saying, I'm not going to go to the feast because it's not time for me to die. 
what he's actually saying is this, that for now, just for right now, for the beginning of the feast, it's not yet time for me to be there because I have other things to do that are more important. But as far as his brothers were concerned, they have nothing more important to do, so you just go ahead and go. Now, I think there's an interesting principle that we can, live, we can draw from this. If you live a useless life, which is the kind of life that the unbelieving brothers were living, a life that has no purpose, it doesn't really matter whether you go or stay as far as, as it were, this, this feast. Your time, you know, go up to the feast and so forth because your time is always at hand. If you, you, if you live a useless, purposeless life, it doesn't really matter what you do because you're just going to do something else that's useless. But if you have a purpose, if you're living with purpose, if you're pursuing that purpose, you're going to find that you really only have the time to do or the only, really your time is going to be taken up by that purpose. You're going to find that you really don't have the time to do what other people are doing who have seemingly endless time to waste on whatever they want to waste it on. Now we do need to ask the question, what is God's will for our lives? What is God's will for your life? Isn't it that you become the servant of all? Isn't that what Jesus did? He, he was exalted to the place of highest authority and power because he became the servant of all because he had purpose and his purpose was always to be serving the Father. Well, that's what your purpose is too. That's what my purpose is, to become the servant of all. And if that is the case, you really can't expect to be, as it were, the master of your own time and of your own schedule because there's always going to be something that needs to be done. And this is just another way of saying that everything you do, you will do for the glory of God. Everything will have a purpose. And that purpose will be to give Him glory. Not to mention the fact there's a lot of people all around you who need your help. You can't expect to have lots of time to give to other things if you are the servant of Christ. Your life will be taken up with that purpose. So you won't be able to be the master of your time, but one thing you can expect is to live a life that has meaning, a life that is fulfilled. It's much better to have something meaningful to do with your time than to just simply squander it and to pour it down a hole on nothing. You know how the Apostle Paul says, redeem the time, buy it up, make the best use of it. Jonathan Edwards has a great sermon on that that talks about how precious even a moment of time is. That even the whole world, when you come to the end of your time, all that God has given to you, the whole world, if you possessed it, would not be able to buy even one more moment of time. And so you shouldn't waste any of it. It's much better to live a life of purpose, a life that will be fulfilled by knowing that you're using it for that purpose God called you to use it for, to be his servant. Now, Jesus knew that the best time to go would not be now. The best time to go would be when he went, and that is in the middle of the feast. May the Lord give us grace not only to live a useful life and a purposeful life, but to be useful at the right time, to know the right timing, as our Lord Jesus Christ did, to know where to give our, t our, our service at each particular time. Now, Jesus pointed out another reason why they, could, why they could go up at any time, but that he could not, and it had to do with the animosity that was there in Judea. The world hated him and wanted to kill him, but it didn't hate them, which is what we saw in verse 7. It wouldn't be dangerous at all for them to go up to the feast because they were the children of the world and the feast was going to be filled with people just like them. Again, even though they were at that time God's people. Jesus said the world loves its own. If Jesus went up to the feast at this time personally, he would be putting himself in danger because the world hated him. Again, I said verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Now, I want you to notice that it didn't just dislike Jesus. It hated Jesus. And why did it hate Jesus? I mean, really, Jesus is love incarnate. Why did they hate Jesus? 
It's because Jesus was trying to help them. He was trying to show them the truth. He was trying to convince them that what they were doing was wrong and that they should turn from that and begin to serve and follow the Father and, of course, to follow Him. Now, Jesus reminds us here that those who are of the world do evil things. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 18, that a bad tree will always bear bad fruit. Now, it doesn't always look like they're bearing bad fruit. Sometimes some of the things they're doing look good because sometimes they do things that are outwardly good, and sometimes we look at the things they're doing and think it's good when they really aren't good. But whatever they do, they always do for self-serving reasons. It's always self that's at the center, selfishness. And that basically is what the essence of sin is, selfishness. We're not doing it for God's glory. We're not doing it because we love Him. We're not doing it because we love our neighbor. We're doing it because we love ourselves. That's the essence of sin, not to mention the fact that we, because we love ourselves so much, we do things we shouldn't be doing. Jesus tells us not to follow their wicked example. Do not follow the people who are in the world. But instead, He tells us to do what He did, to expose their sins by living and speaking as Jesus lived and as he spoke. Jesus spoke out against the sins of the world because he was trying to help them. And so must we. But let's not also forget that there is a price to be paid. When Jesus tried to help them in this way, they repaid his kindness with hatred because what he was saying pricked their consciences because it made them afraid of God's judgment. Now, when the world gets angry at you, they're not going to say, you've convinced me of sin, I feel guilty, I'm afraid of judgment. They're not going to say that. What they're going to say is everything else. They're going to use every other kind of excuse. You're a bigot. You're narrow-minded. You're, you're um, a prude. You're, you're not up to the rest of the times with, with us. Uh, they're going to use everything to put the blame back on you because they are not going to want to admit that what you're telling them, God is bearing witness with in their own consciences that they have sins. The bottom line is the gospel exposes sin and that's why the world will hate you. John writes in 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised brethren if the world hates you. Well, why not? Because it hated Jesus. Why does the world hate you? For the same reason they hated Jesus. We have different masters. We live according to a different set of rules. We have different goals. We're as different as light and darkness, as good and evil. Don't be surprised if, if in trying to help those who are in the world that they hate you in return. And don't be surprised if that happens in your own household. Because people in your household are going to hate you for trying to help them as well. Now, if there are those in your household who don't believe they are of the world. They are in the kingdom of darkness. I, I think we have to recognize that that's true on anyone's view. And if that is the case, there is going to be conflict. So what do you do in a case like that? Well, first of all, just remember, it's better to be hated by the world and uh, by those in your own household for telling them the truth than by becoming their friend by walking on the same path they're walking on. You know, that's one of the ways we often deal with the situation. We sort of enter into their world and we make compromises with them and kind of go the same direction so that we can walk together, but that's not the way we're going to save them. We have to continue to be light. We have to continue to be salts. We have to continue to walk on the path we need to be walking on that Christ calls us on, and we need to call them to repentance. Now, I did jump the gun a bit. I should have realized that was really more of a reason that fits under the last point, but let me just say briefly again, other ways by which we might respond to those who are in our homes or in the world who do not believe. And I think it falls in line with what we just said. We need to be gracious. We need to be patient. Now, I do want you to notice the demeanor of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to just deal with this briefly. That Jesus didn't denounce them. He didn't call down fire and brimstone on them. He didn't get angry at them. But what he did was he, he dealt with them very gently and in humility. And he spoke the truth to them, frankly. 
They made many insinuations against him with regard to his motives and why he was doing what he was doing, but he did not respond in kind. He answered very meekly. He answered, again, very humbly. And let me just mention this again. If, if, if you don't find within yourself that kind of humility, you're going to have a very difficult time dealing with anybody who gets angry with you. Because the first thing that happens is you're going to want, you know, your pride is, is aggravated and you're going to want to just pounce on them. You're going to want to return to them the same thing they just dished out to you. Isn't that the thing you feel when somebody does something you know, mean to you? Don't get mad, get even. And uh, well, Jesus didn't do that because of his humility and his godliness. So when others do get angry at you and they do cruel things to you or say cruel things to you, it never justifies you to repay them in kind. Remember what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Jesus doesn't say if he slaps you on the right cheek, then slap them on the right cheek. He says if they slap you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. In other words, brace yourself for another insult. But do not seek vengeance on them. As a matter of fact, he says, step out of the way and let God deal with it. As far as you're concerned, you always return good for evil. So like Jesus, we need to answer them in gentleness and in love. Secondly, we should seek for their conversion. One thing that maybe we don't notice here is that in Jesus' counsel to his brothers, as far as what they should do, he was sending them to where they might actually be converted. He says in verse 8, go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Go up to the feast. He's not saying stay away from the feast. He says go up because these feasts had a reason. They had a purpose. And that purpose was to remind them of God's kindness and mercy to them. It was one of the means that God gave to their conversion. God commanded it of Israel because he wanted them to be converted by these ordinances. So when you get into a conflict with those in your household, don't forget to use it as an opportunity to bring the gospel to them, to bring it to bear on their minds. It would be nice if we could bring it to bear on their hearts, but we can't. But at least bring it to bear on their minds and pray that God would bring it to bear on their hearts. And then finally, don't let what they do, don't let this conflict, don't let what they say tempt you to sin. Jesus said it wasn't yet time, his time, to go up to this feast because his time had not yet fully come. And we read in verse 9, having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. He didn't allow himself to be influenced by his brothers who were encouraging him to sin. So in seeking to influence those in your house or those who are in the world who do not know Jesus that you run into conflict with, uh, use this as an opportunity to bring the gospel to them, but also make sure that you don't let them negatively influence you. We're warned again and again in Scripture. The more time we spend with people in the world, the more that temptation exists. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Well, may the Lord give us grace, not only to recognize that the battle exists and why it exists, but also to know how to deal with those situations when we're faced with them. Let's, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our lives.